I want to thank everyone for being here today. I understand that there may be some people watching virtually. I also understand that if you're watching from the United States, the latest in the day you could be watching is 4.30 in the morning. Uh, our section chair who was in charge of our World Justice Forum task force within the ABA group lives in Denver. For him, it would be 2.30 in the morning. He was ambivalent about whether or not he would participate live today, but we, uh, I found out earlier today that this session is being recorded. So after this session is done, when you return home, or even later today perhaps, within the app portion of this, this session, you will see the recording of the session, so you can view it right then, so that's very good. You can go back and look at it and see stuff you missed or didn't want to take notes about, or share it with your compatriots who do the work similar to what you do. So we appreciate you doing that very much. During the session, if you have questions on the app, there is a session chat function. I don't know if you've used that yet, but if you go to the app and go down through our session, it says session chat. Send those questions, and Josh, where's Josh? All, all the way in the back of the room, Josh, we'll be receiving those and monitoring those, and then once we finish with live Q&A here in the room, Josh will remind me that we have a question, if any, from folks online. So if they're from this part of the world and further east from us, likely to be online. This part of the world further west from us, not likely, but we appreciate it. I'm very, very honored today to have uh, Mr. Newcomb in the room with us today for a while, so I appreciate Bill being here very much. We've known each other a long time, and uh, if you don't want to talk about baseball, world justice with him, talk about baseball. Uh, if you know his relationship to the San Francisco Giants and the World Series holding the trophy and being doused in cha champagne, let him tell you that story sometime, too. That's a very interesting non-justice. But he, you may say, Bill, that justice was served when the Giants won the World Series, right? That's right. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, who are we? Um, I'm Lee DeHines. I'm a former section chair of the American Bar Association Environmental Energy and Resources section. Claudia Rast over here in the front, who's our rapporteur, is also a former section chair of that section. Howard Kennison, who's our World Justice Task Force chair within our section, is also a former chair of the section. So we have a number of section chairs who are involved in this continuing function of our section. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here today to do that. We are also graced to have on our panel today Zhang Jingjing and Betty Barka, both who agreed to speak with us today. Uh, their bios are on the um, app, so you can read those. We have one other speaker uh, who unfortunately probably won't be able to make it today. He lives in Washington, D.C. He was flying from Cairo, Egypt, to Washington, D.C. today or tonight or whatever, wherever we are in the world of clock time. But he was supposed to land in D.C. at 1 o'clock in the morning D.C. time, but his flight was delayed by several hours. And for him, it would have been 4.30 in the morning to be with us live anyway. Uh, so I don't believe he's going to be able to make it. We heard an email from him at 4 o'clock this morning our time. So, And Roger is the Chief Sustainability Officer for General Electric Corporation. Betty's with, uh, she's a, with Civicus. She's on their board. And Zhang Jingjing is a uh, professor at the University of Maryland. And Bob Percival, who's here in the room with her, helps run that environmental program at Maryland. We had the privilege in 2019 of having uh, Zhang and Bob on a program with us here at the World Justice Forum at The Hague. So that's why we're here. Our section has been a sponsor of the World Justice Project since 2008 from the very first forum, uh, and we've been a sponsor every time the forum's been held where we had an opportunity to participate. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here again today. Okay, what is it topic-wise that brings us into the room today? Uh, the first thing is that our section has, well, let me back up a step. In the American Bar Association, the ABA president and leaders of the ABA can only speak publicly about policy that our policy body, the House of Delegates, has approved. So in the last several years, there have been two resolutions that our section has uh, had approved by the House of Delegates that brings us to you today. One is on climate change, uh, adopted uh, in 2019, and one is on environmental justice, adopted in 2021 by the House of Delegates. And so let me read you the essence of what each one of those resolutions says. The EJ resolution, environmental justice, says that 
The ABA advances environmental justice pr principles and call upon all levels of government, meaning all levels of government that the ABA speaks to, but it, I don't think it's limited to the United States, but certainly it's focused on the United States, that environmental justice laws, regulations, guidelines, policies, and best practices, and here's the thing that ties into the World Justice uh, Project goals of rule of law, reflect the right of every human being to dignity in a clean and healthy environment. You've heard that said a number of times already here at the, at the forum. The other resolution that speaks to this is called the Climate Change Resolution. And there we wanted every federal, state, local, and territorial and tribal government and the private sector, all of them, to recognize our obligations to take action to achieve the following goals. There are three of them. One, reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions to net zero or below as soon as possible, consistent with the latest peer-reviewed science. Number two, contribute the U.S. fair share to hold the increase in global average temperature to the lowest possible increase above pre-industrial levels. Peer-reviewed science is a key word to think about in this climate change space. And many, of you may, many of you may or may not be aware that some people say climate change is just a normal phenomenon of, you know, weather cycles go up and down over decades or generations or hundreds of years, and, it'll, you know, it'll get better. I think those of us who have studied this and been in this field for a long time uh, understand that this is a science issue. This is not a political issue. There's too many things going on, and you'll hear both our speakers talk about this, particularly Betty, about how her island, home island of Fiji is subject to being washed away because of rising sea levels, because of global warming. That's not a political issue. That's a fact issue. That's a science fact. The other thing I want, I forgot to ask at the beginning, um, I just want to do a show of hands for folks. How many people in the room are lawyers? If you just raise your hand. Good. How many people in here are scientists, physical scientists, you know, scientists who study these kind of issues? No scientists? Professors? Any professors in the room? Good. How about um, folks who are in civil society groups who are looking at climate change issues and combating those? Anyone, oh, thank you, anyone in the room, a litigant in a climate change action that I may be mentioning today, you don't know what I'm going to mention, so it's a guess on your part. Anybody a litigant currently in any climate change litigation, either for or against somebody? Okay, all right. Not likely to offend anybody then. Um, well, another show of hands. This is my 48th year practicing law, environmental law. So... Um, I recognize, I look around the room, the bright, light's a little bright, but I, th I see a few faces in the room I know haven't reached the age of 48 yet. So it means that you were born after I started practicing environmental law in 1974. So I appreciate very much you being here. And it's interesting listening to Ms. Eiffel this morning that her progression of her thoughts from when she was young through things happened in her life how it changed her perspective on what has happened and what can still happen. And I was very much moved by the fact that she talked about both uh, Justice Ginsburg and her own family having humble, humble beginnings and look at where you can be today. I'm the, only, I'm the first person in my family to attend college. Neither one of my parents attended college. I have four sisters. Three of them attended college. So... You look at where you are and where you've been. The other thing you learn, I think, in practicing law as long as I have, is you are a product of every experience you've had every day. Things I've learned during this forum have changed how I think about things and moving forward. So it's, it's you're a product of your, of your uh, uh, path through life. Uh, I'm sorry she couldn't join us. Um, many of you know Mary Robinson former president of Ireland and been very active in climate change and climate justice. She has a book called Climate Justice. Um, I wanted her to be on our panel, but she's in another panel at the exact same time as we are. So I'm disappointed by that. So I'm going to do a stand-in for her and read a little bit, a couple sentences from her book that I think are very appropriate for us to be thinking about 
as we progress through this program today. To deal with climate change, we must simultaneously address the underlying injustice in our world and work to eradicate poverty, exclusion, and inequality. That injustice is embodied in the fate of 1.3 billion people around the world who still have no access to electricity. 2.6 million people who still cook over open fires. If we are properly address climate change, we must do so in tandem with improving the lives of these people by giving them access to electricity, cook stoves, renewable energy resources, not fossil fuels. We need to create, and you heard this line before today, people-centered, need to create a people-first platform for those on the margins suffering the worst effects of climate change and amplify their voices to ensure them at a seat at the table in any future climate change negotiations. And you also heard this gentleman's quoted here during the forum already. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, climate justice can be a new narrative of hope. And that's what we hope to bring you some more about this morning. The uh, UN guiding principles, the business and human rights principles, the SDGs, the IPCC, the climate change reports by the UN, all of which you are aware of those, uh, have been just telling us and convincing us and inspiring us to continue to move forward in a way that uh, addresses the issues that climate change brings to the table. Again, I mentioned earlier the app we put on the back table back there. Uh, it's, it's on our uh, session as well, but if you want to scan it, it's easy to do. Briefly mention three lawsuits that are going on now. One is the Royal Dutch Shell Netherlands case. All the material from that case is the decision from 2021, May of 2021, a year ago, where the court required Dutch Shell to reduce its emissions by 45% by 2030 across all of its activities, including subsidiaries, in both its emissions and emissions of all of its end users of their materials. So if you're buying natural gas or oil from Shell, the court has ordered Shell to make sure that those end users, all, if each one of you are a customer of Shell, you have to reduce your end use emissions as well. Another case that started in 2015, one that's still active in the federal courts, one of, and, and which is actually active in the court that uh, Judge McEwen uh, is on the bench, the Ninth Circuit. It's called the Giuliani case, where 21 youth have sued the United States government to do something about climate change. From this perspective of we are young people whose future and livelihood and ability to progress through our lives uh, is very much threatened by the fact that climate change is not being addressed adequately by our federal government. And again, there's material on the app uh, that, that gives you much more about that. And then the other case I found most interesting, and it's just a ruling that came out again last month, this involves a case going on in Switzerland, which applies more to people my age than to some of you young people in the room because it's, a, it's the, sort of the opposite side of the Giuliani case. These are folks, the average age of all the plaintiffs in the case is 73 years old. And their argument is, that the failure of the Swiss government to do something about climate change affects their ability to have a remaining life of their remainder of their life be a lively one, one that they can appreciate and enjoy uh, for the rest of their life. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights um, was brought before the Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, and they said they would review the case, and apparently. All 17 judges on that court said they want to review the case. That's the first time that court has ruled unanimously that a human rights case should move forward. So again, an interesting case to follow. Uh, again, it's, we reference uh, more details about it in your material. Um, I don't have the name right in front of me, Hans, but it's in our materials on the app. Um, if you take a look at it. The other thing I wanted to mention, two other things real quick. One is, this forum is taking place this week here at The Hague. Last week in Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic Forum took place. And the World Economic Forum 
for the first time they had eight, not the first time they had eight themes, but they had eight themes, one of which was climate and nature. And there were 16 different separate panels, just like we're having here, of all the world economic leaders who were at Davos talking about climate. And if you read, and, and again, we have a link to all of that on our, on the uh, QR code. If you read through that, you will read through, go to that link and look through all the things they talked about. They had two press conferences during that time, one of which the climate uh, czar, if you will, former U.S. Secretary of State uh, John Kerry led a press conference and another separate press conference the next day uh, when former U.S. Vice President Al Gore uh, spoke about climate change issues. They were not on a panel by themselves, but they were the key principals in those two press conferences. So again, go to that World uh, Economic Forum website and look through it, and you will find some very good information with respect to what the world economic leaders are talking about. And finally, I'll uh, mention that uh, US, UN Secretary General uh, in May, when I wrote these notes, it was still in May, but now I know we're in June, uh, he made his uh, summary draft of his progress report on the SDGs that will be made to the UN Week uh, in September. And in there, he focused on uh, climate change, and he said the impacts of climate change are already being felt across the world, further delaying urgent need to, to a green economy. CO2 emissions have to be reduced or a climate catastrophe will occur that we may not be able to ever be able to recover from. Again, very profound, very solid words from the UN Secretary General that we have to do something and do something soon. A book that's on the, uh, again, on the QR code, it's called Legal Pathways to De Decarbonization in the United States, published by the Environmental Law Institute of the United States. Even though this is a legal pathways document that talks about how you can adopt laws and regulations in the United States to deal with decarbonizing the economy, the ideas in here are not unique to the United States. This had to be written for United States lawyers to implement in the United States, but this is, again, a worldwide application. And again, if you go to the information on the QR code, you will see that uh, very helpful information is there. Also, on the, we mentioned these, and I mentioned these because IDLO, the uh, Inter 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 International Development Law Organization, they're one of the uh, partners for the uh, forum. There are two publications that are on the QR code site, but I also picked up two of them from them. And one in particular is the one that, uh, one that Betty's gonna talk about a little bit, rule of law approach to transformative climate action, which gives you a template on how to deal with, uh, dealing with climate change. And the other one is climate justice for women and girls, a rule of law approach to feminist climate action. In conjunction with the ABA, in uh, March of this year, during UN Women's Week, um, a number of individuals from the UABA participated, uh, President-elect Deverinus Ross, uh, soon-to-be President-elect Mary Smith participated, a number of other speakers, Renee Doplik, uh, Amy Edwards, Michelle Diffender, for all ABA leaders within the environmental space or the ABA space uh, participated. So we very much appreciate uh, them sharing information with us and what you will see again on the QR code is you can find a link to the videos of each one of those sessions so you can just go through and scroll through and listen to what you want to hear, listen to what those folks have to say. So we wanted to make this resource available to you so not here in this 45 minutes when we talk and the rest of the time in Q&A, not to be the end of your conversation and thoughts about what to do about climate change. So let's now turn to our panel members and give them an opportunity to challenge each one of us and challenge each other to how we should proceed with uh, what we want to achieve. And I'm gonna ask, what I'm gonna do is, and our panel members know this, hopefully they know this or remember it uh, when we went over this, that I'm gonna ask them uh, some questions. They will respond in sort of brief uh, snippets and then we'll do some follow-up questions. Both of them have particular items they want to talk about. We'll give them an opportunity to do that as well. And after about 40 minutes or so, we will give you an opportunity then to ask questions of us 
uh, and we can respond in ways that hopefully help you learn more about what to do. So first, Jing Jing, I'm going to ask you this question. I think you already know the answer. I know you know the answer. Uh, and that is, what does climate justice mean to you, and what's the path to get from where we are to where we need to be? Thank you. Uh, it's a challenging question. Uh, you ask me to uh, define the very complicated um, issue and in my second language. I'm uh, Chinese and uh, English is not my <laughs> native language, and, uh, but I, I will try. Uh, but before I um, yeah, give your an answer, uh, I want to say I'm very happy to return this uh, forum. Three years ago, uh, my project uh, was, uh, at University of Maryland Law School uh, with Professor Percival. We, uh, we were one of the 30 finalists uh, of the uh, challenge, uh, Justice Challenge 2019. I'm very glad uh, I'm returning this forum and to share my work related to the climate change and uh, environmental justice. Uh, in the past three years. Uh, so I'm trying to answer the question about what the climate justice is. I think uh, climate justice, uh, climate change affects the individuals and the community, its rights to a clean and healthy environment and harm communities in the underdeveloped uh, countries and the regions and women, children, and the indig indigenous people uh, this uh, proper uh, more severe, and climate justice is uh, action that regulate greenhouse emitters and put responsibility on them, hold them accountable, and apply legal uh, remedy to the affected individuals, community, and the nations, and mitigate climate change caused harms. And that is my uh, answer as a climate and the environment litigator. Um, yeah, that is, uh, I already, yeah, point out to the panel. I'll ask for your 10-point paper <laughs> later on you know, to, so you can get a grade in this class, okay? <laughs> Betty, how about you? What do you think? What does climate justice mean to you? Sure, thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Betty, and um, as, as has been mentioned, I'm from Fiji, but now I call Australia home. So um, if you don't know how Pacific Islanders answer questions, we like to tell stories, so I'm going to tell you a uh, very short story right. of what climate justice means to me and for other people in the Pacific. And this goes back to why I am a climate justice vocalist, researcher, and activist to begin with. Um, I was 18, a university student, and I was just entering the world of academia, trying to figure out my place in the world. Um, and there, I was fortunate enough to be part of a Pacific Leaders convening in, in Fiji. Um, we had gathered um, about 100 young leaders from across the Pacific Island nations, and we had a week long of capacity building, is, is the term that's always been used. We were taught about what it meant, what climate justice meant, what climate change meant. Um, at the end of that forum, there was a person from the Marshall Islands called Ben, and he came up. And I was young and naive, and I had just come out of the education system that did, does not address climate change at all. Um, and he stood in the middle of the room and begged for us to send him sand because he was from the Marshall Islands. He stood in the middle of the room and said, if he threw a stone from the middle of his island, it would land in either direction it would land in the ocean. So it doesn't matter where on the island he stood, if he threw a stone, it would land in the ocean. And he begged all of us in that room to send a sack of sand so he could save his island home. And to me, that was a reality check. There, how in the world are we ever going to save people's homes in this unforeseen, unknown, aspect, especially for smaller islands like Marshall Islands that are atolls. We come from Fiji, which is one of the bigger islands, which does have some capacity, but I was not at the stage where I was standing in the middle or standing in front of my home and watching the water come in as, um, as we lived our everyday lives. So to me, climate justice is about saving our homes 
our people's livelihoods, our people's link to the land and everything that we call home. And to me, justice is about saving what we call our own, but also being able to maintain our dignity in a way that, that serves us to live a dignified life in this unknown crisis that keeps creeping up on us, for the, especially for people who are least responsible for the crisis in the Pacific Island nation. So to me, climate justice means that. Thanks, Betty. I don't know if you sensed it, but I certainly did. There's an emotion behind this. This is not just, this is not about politics. This is about life and dignity and ability to thrive moving forward. And if your life, your place where you live can't be there anymore, then it's hard to survive. Uh, Jing Jing, you've been doing a lot of work, I know, um, around the world, and you're going to be doing some after, even after this forum. Tell us a little bit about uh, an issue that both you and I have, but a little backstory here. I've been doing some pro bono work in the country of Zimbabwe. And the issues there are um, how you know, foreign companies come into the country and mine their resources and don't respect the environment, don't respect the people, don't respect the land, don't respect landowner rights. And you may or may not be aware in most African countries, Title to the land is very limited to a limited number of people. Most land is what they call customary land or common land. And so title to that is not vested in one individual. It's invested in the community, tribal chiefs, uh, government officials. In Zimbabwe, the president of the country holds the sole privilege of saying how the land can be used. It's not, if it's not owned by a company or owned by the government, the president of the company, country says, here's how this land can be used. So mining companies get permits through the government. The government says they can go come in on somebody's land and displace the people on the land. So we've been helping them deal with the legal issues associated with that at environmental group there. And then the other thing that's happening is most of these companies are Chinese owned. And I was on a Zoom call with those folks a few weeks ago and I mentioned to them that I'm gonna be on a panel with Jing Jing and they said, well, we already know her. We've been working there for years. So let me go from that to what you can talk a little bit about your China your peer experience with China government and Chinese owned companies and their, what they call the Belt and Road Initiative and what the impacts are on the environment, particularly on climate change, in less than 30 minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm uh, a Chinese uh, litigator. I think it, uh, probably I'm only one in this uh, uh, forum, in this room I'm the, at the forum, uh, practicing uh, Chinese laws. and. I was a litigator in China, and uh, I have been uh, doing all the pollution-related tort cases and uh, uh, administrative cases against uh, government uh, decision on the uh, environment impact assessment. Uh, I was called China's Aaron Brockovich uh, for, <laughs> uh, for winning a class action suit in 2007. Um, but, um, yeah, recently the work uh, since I uh, moved out from uh, China to uh, United States and uh, started work and initiated the work and the University of Maryland, uh, we started this uh, uh, environment clinical project called the, uh, the T project, the Transnational Environment Accountability Project, which won uh, as the, the, the one of the 30, uh, 30 finalists uh, three years ago and here. And in the past three years, we incorporated an independent uh, organization called the CT Center for Transnational Environment Accountability. Our work is uh, uh, to um, track and follow um, the international invest uh, project in Africa and uh, Latin America, especially the direct investment from China on the China's Belt Road uh, Initiative. As you know, my country, my home country, China, is the world biggest uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emitter. And we, your country, your nation, your people uh, are the victims of the uh, climate change and which uh, the, those harms posed by my home country, China. And so we are a perfect match here talking about the climate uh, change issue. 
and China's uh, Belt Road Initiative, if you, some of you from Africa or Latin America and uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, you may know uh, China's, uh, the government-backed uh, investment uh, um, um, policy Belt Road Initiative has a very uh, significant impact on the in global environment and climate governance. And all those projects uh, back uh, big uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, energy project, and mining project backed by the Chinese government um, has a profound uh, impact on the local community. Their uh, uh, right to a clean and healthy environment. So our work is to hold those Chinese uh, corporation uh, accountable for their environment climb uh, impact. So let me give you some uh, cases, uh, example, how we use law to help those community in those underdeveloped uh, regions and the countries and how uh, law works and how the law uh, couldn't work. And uh, so let me uh, start from uh, Latin America. And uh, in Ecuador, which um, I assume many of you know this uh, very um, well-known um, non-litigation, uh, the um, Ecuador versus Chevron case. And, uh, and there is, a, a last year, there's a, a new uh, case against uh, Chinese uh, subsidiary, Chinese um, state-owned oil company, CNPC, China National Petroleum uh, Corporation's local subsidiary, um, Oriental uh, Petrol. And, uh, it, the case was uh, filed by a community affected by the Chevron. So the, it's a union of the people affected by the Chevron, uh, UDAPT, and uh, it's a member of the uh, uh, one Rena uh, indigenous people, and with uh, two, three other um, NGOs, they filed litigation um, based on the right of nature and uh, climate change uh, for the community. They ask uh, the, the defendant, the uh, Chinese um, subsidiary, Ch CNPC's subsidiary, uh, to reduce uh, its uh, climate impact. The case uh, didn't um, succeed. Um, the judge made it in favor um, a judgment, in favor of the uh, corporation, and the, the, so the case was dismissed, um, but uh, you see there is uh, an effort uh, made by indigenous people and supported by the an environment uh, nonprofit organization, the human rights uh, organizations in Ecuador. And this is the first case um, I was um, trying to provide um, some um, legal advice to those um, in this group and the NGOs and uh, on the China's uh, in, uh, laws and policies regarding uh, the overseeing investment. Um, this is one case. And then there are more cases in Africa. And especially I would like to uh, touch upon this uh, China, uh, Chinese uh, arrangement, uh, China's deal with African nations, uh, this typical deal we call uh, natural resource for infrastructure uh, arrangement. So uh, in general, this is an arrangement uh, done by um, China, the uh, state of China and no, uh, the African nations. Um, China will provide um, loans to build infrastructure project. In return, African countries agree to pay back with minerals. So that uh, type of uh, uh, deals um, has profound uh, environment and climate impact. Uh, it's much bigger than individual investment uh, project uh, because under the one agreement, uh, there will be a bunch of the uh, individual projects. So there are uh, highway uh, infrastructure pro project include uh, building the highway, uh, railway, hospitals, and uh, uh, other um, projects. In return, uh, the host country, the African uh, country, uh, agreed to pay back with uh, cobalt, uh, copper, bauxite, and oil. And so that arrangement um, have yeah, 
much bigger environment uh, impact than individual cases. Uh, still, we haven't figured out what uh, legal um, path we can uh, take uh, to urge China to be um, responsible for those uh, um, deals. But under those deals, we've uh, identified ca individual um, cases, uh, individual uh, project. Uh, we can use um, the local laws, international um, uh, treaty, environment treaty, and the human rights treaty mechanism, and to hold Chinese uh, investment uh, accountable. So let me start from the first one uh, in Ghana. Um, Arucha Ghana is a local nonprofit uh, nature conservancy uh, group uh, with uh, 12 other uh, local communities and NGOs filed a constitutional suit and a high court uh, suing its national government for signing agreement with Sino Hydro, a state-owned Chinese uh, corporation. And it is an uh, infrastructure for natural resource deal. And uh, Sino Hydro uh, get a loan from Chinese banks and uh, is uh, building infrastructure project uh, for Ghana. And in return, uh, Ghana will pay back bauxite. And so the bauxite mining will affect uh, uh, Ativa forest, which is uh, Ghana's um, oldest forest. And that um, the constitution of, um, Lawsuit is based on the uh, Ghani um, constitutional law. There is article on uh, right to health environment. So there is a uh, um, right to environment uh, article in the Ghani uh, constitutional law. And community and NGO are using that article and request government uh, uh, revoke and uh, change that uh, agreement. So that is one uh, a legal path uh, we are using. Uh, we are supporting local community to use constitutional uh, lawsuit. And second, I want to uh, the um, civil society organization in DRC. They are using their access to information law to get uh, the uh, Chinese corporations uh, deal with um, the Congolese government. Uh, you know, the cobalt, copper, and they are critical minerals for energy transition, and China is the biggest uh, consumer of the, uh, those critical and minerals include cobalt, lithium, uh, copper, and all sorts of the uh, minerals uh, vital to our um, the, uh, renewable energy uh, and the transition, uh, energy transition. And China needs those uh, minerals. And so you see the um, many Chinese corporations, including state-owned enterprise and private companies, are uh, running and competing the, those minerals in DRC. And DRC NGO are using their local uh, access in, to information laws to connect those information, their monitor and report Chinese corporations, uh, climate and environment and human rights performance. So those are uh, uh, the second path we are taking use access to information requests and access to information laws and to connect uh, the information we need to prepare our uh, next step and uh, get the evidence, the facts, to pre uh, prepare the litigation. Um, Let me ask you a question. Um, at least my, my understanding of the sort of broader Chinese Belt and Road Initiative yeah. effort is the Chinese government is not doing this so the Chinese companies can make a lot of money. I mean, they obviously do make money off of what they're mining and extracting. But the whole goal here is to the extent that China doesn't have access to those resources within their own boundaries, they know the African countries do. And these are opportunities to go into countries that need economic development. And so the Chinese money and, and jobs that come with these mining and extractive industry activities then lead to uh, sort of a willing partnership. That if, you know, it's just like any you know in any country, company X is going to come into your community, build a facility, hire a bunch of people. People see revenue, they see opportunities for people to have jobs didn't have before, and so these African countries, which have been poor, see this opportunity for the Chinese companies to do this. The issue, in addition to all the environmental impacts, is that a lot of these are what they call the rare earths minerals that are used for lithium batteries and various kinds of cell phone technologies and other advancing technologies. And so the Chinese companies know this, 
And so they're going into those most vulnerable places to get the most valuable materials and turn to use them back uh, in China to help the Chinese company, economy stay afloat. Let me switch just for a second and ask Betty a question too, Jing, and we can come back to you. Yeah. Betty, you, you've done a lot of work, and, and I think you're doing, I don't forget the exact title of your thesis for your PhD, but it's all about um, how climate change is affecting, uh, particularly in the Pacific area, the most marginal uh, populations. You, your story about the gentleman being able to throw rocks into the water from wherever he was on his island and give me a bag of sand is really profound, very basic. Give me a sand so my house doesn't wash away. So can you talk a little bit about what your research is and so what your findings have been so far? Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Jinjing. I think we're definitely very different projects, but um, I can share a few things that I've been doing. I am two months pre-submission for my PhD thesis, so I can speak on this for hours, but I will not. <laughs> um, um, we'll give you an A, so just go ahead. <laughs> I wish, but okay. Um, so my thesis is specifically looking at state-led planned relocation efforts um, in Fiji. And so within, the, within Fijian communities, there have been about 80 villages that are largely indigenous that need to be relocated within the next five years. If they are not, water will come, you know, sea, sea water will come into their villages, into their homes, and will affect their livelihoods. It's already affecting their crops. Most of these families rely on fishing. Um, and subsistence farming for, you know, for their livelihoods. Um, this has also, you know, driven people from their villages to move into urban centers, and we already know the challenges of high rates of urbanization. This is, there is a little data so showing that they're being pushed beyond, um, beyond borders because solely because of climate change, but that evidence is also growing. The climate change mobility data is also growing. And so one of the other exciting things that I do, aside from my, my PhD, is I am working with a small team of um, academics and researchers that is working closely with Pacific governments, Pacific Island governments, in sort of proactively developing an agenda for climate change mobility and what that means for Pacific Island peoples. Um, what, what does this mean for, for Pacific Island peoples to live with dignity uh, once they have been displaced from their homes? Um, to share more concretely one of the things that my thesis looks at, and, and it looks at the gendered impacts of climate, climate induced displacement and planned relocation, and by that I do mean that I'm looking at women, men, and gender non-binary people's impacts. And so my thesis does have a wide range of findings in, in the terms that it shows the same old challenges that, you know, women's wor workload get burdened, um, high rates of sexual and gender-based violence, there's a limited agency given, you know, um, higher responsibility. But one of the other things that came up was people were just not talking to each other. There has been a shift in mindsets. People now know that gender equality is core to sustainable change. And we need more practices. So people understand the value and they are trying to change how, and the change has started within household levels. Young women feel more empowered to speak within their families on crucial decision points, on what the family should do, on how they should do it. Men within these households are more willing to listen to people. However, these are slower, more time-consuming changes that need to be supported systemically. And I think that's something that, when a state-led planned relocation effort is happening, is something that the state can systemically em embody through very carefully thought out processes. Um, in the case of Fiji, this is a start. They have developed, well, back in the day, a few years ago, in 2019, they were one of the first few countries in the world to develop planned relocation and displacement guidelines specifically as a result of climate change. And within that, they had standard operating procedures that carefully looked at the gendered impacts of things and how to involve people from the very beginning of, of the process. So for instance, for in indigenous Fijian communities that are called Ethoke communities, the land and the ocean connection is very culturally connected to their sense of belongingness and identity. And how this, how to relocate something that is, I 
can't hear myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds horrible. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> but, but how to do that in a meaningful way that is not ad adding to trauma for, you know, not just leaving the place, but also bringing their ancestors with them. So in the first village that was relocated in Fiji, the first thing they relocated was the graves of their ancestors. And that was only done because the Fijian government took a very community-centered approach. Of course, there, were, there is much to be improved within that system, but I think they got the essence right, where they started talking to people, they uh, convened gender-specific groups, um, you know. And of course, there, there will remain challenges of like age groups, the young people remained excluded, gender non-binary people still were fighting to find places within tra traditional hierarchical systems. But I think that it, it gives me hope and many others like me who work in the climate space that there is an intentional shift and great political willingness to take proactive action to this sort of uh, disaster that is lurking on our doorsteps. So what we've heard so far is, and, and a lot of this is, again, we could talk at this. Yes, Bill. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. But in, in reality, I think some or all of that labor comes from Chinese labor. And whether it's imported Chinese labor to these jobs that aren't available in China, or it's the local labor pool, there become issues about labor conditions. And this is true of almost any extraction right. industry, but certainly it's there in, in, in most ones. Is, is it the case that those are two other elements of these transactions that we should be I mean, the neighbor rights issue and... Yes. Uh, well, the, the money, I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the money. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have been seeing this uh, issue, all the issue around this uh, subject, uh, environment and human rights impact, and neighbor rights violations, and of course, uh, bribery, corruption. And uh, uh, let me share you a story. Um, in the country, uh, Guinea, a tiny country in West Africa, but with very rich uh, minerals, uh, two thirds of the bauxite reserve in the world is in this tiny country. And uh, a Chinese uh, corporation donated, claim, uh, donated five million to the government, uh, the minerals of the um, geology and the mine to conduct national mining survey. So the donation itself, uh, it's in the company's ESG uh, annual report, and they're very uh, proud uh, to announce it. Uh, it's a donation, five million US donor to this tiny country as don donation. Um, we don't know, we, there is no any transparency at all how this uh, um, transaction made and uh, how the the government, the Minister of the Geology, Guinea, uh, uh, Minister of the Geology and the Mine use that, that donation. There's no, um, no details, no transparency. And um, um, when the president, previous uh, uh, President Conde was uh, uh, turned over by the military coup last year, that piece of news was gone from the both government side. Only the corporation kept that piece of information in its ESG report because it cannot change it. It already submit, uh, um, and it's already in public domain. So that I, I very, um, I'm very, I was very suspicious on that donation. What's the nature of the donation? Corporation, a Chinese corporation, donated to the country, which um, gave the big mining uh, deals uh, to this company, and 
but also interesting uh, things in the same country, Guinea, and the previous minister of the theology of the mind was sentenced to jail in U.S. because he received the bribery uh, from a Chinese company, and he has a dual citizenship, uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. citizenship as a Guinea, uh, the uh, Guinea citizenship. So he was uh, prosecuted by the, um, the uh, state, uh, New York state, because he received bribery as an American citizen, and he violated the Foreign uh, Corrupt uh, Act, uh, Practice Act. And so that is a very powerful legal instrument uh, uh, the United States uh, has. Uh, in China, we do have a one article in uh, uh, our criminal uh, law, which is called for bribing uh, foreign uh, government and international uh, organization on uh, crime. But that article has never been used, has never been used uh, to prosecute the Chinese corporations uh, for their bribery outside China. Bill, to further answer your question, and my experience in both Kenya and Zimbabwe, is the money comes in at the presidential level. There's no accountability for it in any document. Any, and any citizen requests the revenue sharing agreement from the government as to where the money's going. They claim confidentiality over it. Uh, and so you don't see where the money goes. It's easy to see that in those countries, those who are in power suddenly have greater wealth than they had before they became into power. And it's not just because the country is doing well, it's because they're getting money from sources that are not accounted for. Uh, the other thing that's happening in Zimbabwe, and it's something that Jing Jing and I are going to talk about a couple weeks from now, is in January this year, the Chinese embassy came out and criticized civil society in the country for complaining about all these problems with the Chinese companies. The Chinese Chamber of Commerce in China and Zimbabwe jumped on the same thing. And then more recently in May, last month, the Chinese embassy came out and accused the U.S. embassy of taking the side of civil society. And again, you've seen now editorial cartoons that the Chinese have been putting out showing the, China, the United States is coming in imposing sanctions on Zimbabwe for this, this, and that. And it's all hurting the economy of the country. And the Chinese are ones in there trying to help boost, boost the economy and so I actually have a Zoom call next week with the people in Zimbabwe to talk about how we approach the Chinese, and that's why we want to use expertise of one of their citizens, now a U.S. citizen, to help combat what they're doing. What about the employment labor question? Are there Chinese workers coming to these projects displacing native labor? My, my sense is... What are the labor conditions? In general, uh, for all those infrastructure projects, uh, if uh, Chinese corporations are contractor, they tend to bring the Chinese workers to the site and then build the, uh, the cap, the workers' cap. And uh, those Chinese workers, they are on the very harsh, uh, difficult working condition. So their rights, their, um, their rights also have been yeah. affected. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, um, some Chinese company, I think, uh, um, if they're mining in the mining sector or on the manufacturer, they do hire local workers. Uh, but the uh, issue around like the safe working environment, um, are there, like the right to the, uh, of the, uh, the contract, the neighbor contract, most time uh, they won't, local uh, worker won't have a written contract and they're not protected by their, um, their um, neighbor rights law or some countries just don't have such a uh, legal instrument and uh, their local, local right, uh, workers' rights haven't been uh, protected. And they are, uh, at most Chinese corporation, you are not allowed to have uh, your u union. You, and that is a, uh, another big issue. Um, even though it's not a subject I'm, I'm familiar with, but I have observed, I have uh, heard, I have traveled uh, 11, 12 uh, African country, um, and uh, have been working uh, West Africa for four years and traveled there many times. So I have heard a lot of discussing on the workers uh, issue. Um, certainly um, environment and human rights and broader human rights issue, 
uh, include neighbor rights and the bribery um, corruption. There's three major um, um, problems associated with Chinese investment in Africa. Let me ask, uh, I'm gonna ask each panel member one more question, then I'll turn to all y'all to weigh in on what you wanna say. Uh, I, heard, I forget which one of the uh, plenary sessions I heard this in, but the uh, moderator said, if you had a magic wand, what would you, how would you wave it to solve the problem? So I'm gonna first ask Betty, if you had a magic wand, I know Betty's gonna totally ask me first. Uh, had a magic wand, what would you do to solve the problem you're encountering? And then Jing Jing, I'll give you the second opportunity to answer that same question. Magic wand, isn't that, it, you can make this up. It's your magic wand, you know? You, you're the king of the world or queen of the world for a day. What would you do to make this go away? Sure, I mean, if I had a magic wand, there'd be like a few things I'd <laughs> zip away. But <laughs> if I had one wish, I guess it would be to wave it across the world so that people who never wanted to leave their home ever had to, um, and they felt safe where they were. Um, and if they did choose to leave their home, they would be protected and welcomed. Um, and that magic wand would be my one thing if I had to ask today. All right, good, <laughs> thank you. Jing Jing, how about you? Your magic wand, what would you, how would you wave it? And what would you do? Obviously, all those um, um, corporate and the government uh, actors, they all uh, got their uh, legal penalties. So, <laughs> 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 and they're, yeah, they're paying their um, uh, responsibility to their harms. And that's uh, um, my magic one. So your yeah. magic one would be to bring people to justice, <laughs> right? Okay. Let's open it up to the floor here. If folks have questions, uh, let's start. I'll start on this. We've got three sections, one, two, three. Let's start in section one over here. Raise your hand, just ask your question. Stand so we can, I think we'll give you a microphone so we can. This is being recorded and people are watching online, so we need to be able to hear what you have to say. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Stella from Project Spirit Justice, and I have a question for the professor. So you talked about uh, the use of the freedom of information um, law request in uh, in DRC. Has it worked in your case, in your experience, and how long does it take usually to to access the information on government deals uh, through through this law? Thank you. <laughs> so make sure I just, how does how does a request for information from the government does it really work and is it effective? Yeah, exactly. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the DRC is a member of the uh, EITI country, you know, uh, Extractive uh, um, Transparency um, Initiative. And so they are required um, um, to the, the government and the corporations are required to disclose uh, their uh, contract and, and um, their, all those uh, agreements are in the public domain. Um, we just start the work, and I still learning uh, their uh, local uh, requirement on the access to information. How long it would take? Uh, I cannot give you the exact uh, uh, the, uh, answer of the how how long, how how many months we would uh, take. In other country, other uh, African country, we are also trying to use uh, their access information uh, law, uh, like in uh, Nigeria, in Zimbabwe. Uh, we all submit uh, similar uh, requests to the government, request releasing uh, the disclosure um, those countries' agreement with China. And we got some um, information in, in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in Nigeria, we got a piece of information, and in other countries we yeah, rejected, like in, in Guinea, the government just rejected and re, um, uh, released uh, that uh, um, uh, China, Guinea, um, infer, uh, the, the, they called the uh, environment, uh, economic uh, collaboration framework agreement, uh, which signed in 2017 when the president, previous president uh, Conde visited China. That uh, uh, agreement is not in the public domain. Uh, it took us a year to request, get the uh, um, 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 response, uh, but the response is no, we don't um, 
uh, it's not necessary for the government to release the information. So the, it uh, varied the length of the time of the releasing information based on the local uh, legal requirements. So in my experience in Kenya and Zimbabwe and also Malawi is that you can make the request, but you seldom get the information you want. You rarely get it in time to do anything with it. And the business agreements between the companies and the government are almost ever, never, ever released because the revenue sharing arrangements between the company and the government are all embedded in these agreements. And the public, they don't want the public to know that because they would realize that and first in Kenya, the, the Constitution, the statute, I think the Constitution in the statute says 5% has to go to the local, neighbor, local community to be invested, but they don't want anybody to know what that total amount of money is, therefore they'd be clamoring for give me my 5% of X amount. So if you can never see the agreement, you don't know what the outcome is. Another question over here in what I call Section 1. Yes, sir. Jonathan, you have your hand up? I can't quite see the lights here. Our friend, from, speaking of Ghana, is a friend from Ghana here. Yes, I think I uh, agree with what Bill, is it Bill, said. And I could relate to the struggle you go through when you are dealing with China and Ghana in terms of the Etiwa Forest. You know, it's been a national issue that we've been struggling with. And so there are some few comments I want to give. And then when he said, if you want to wave your flag, what will you do? And probably Wand, not flag, wand, magic wand. wand. Get your, get your, get yes, your, so get your that, magic right, okay? Y yes, in that, <laughs> in, in that situation, in terms of even the labor he mentioned, you're very much aware that at some point, there were Chinese prisoners who were brought to come and work. So when they promised labor, at the end of the day, the core technical aspect of labor for Africa, we don't get it. The mineral labor, if it's even done by some people who are prisoners, brought down. I don't know if it has stopped, but we really had that. But looking at Etiwa and what happened, we want to propose when these contracts are being signed, civil society and organizations like yours and that of the existing uh, uh, country must have an oversight committee that will look at this. That will help because no matter how much you are paying the civil society rep on that committee, in terms of seeing the implementation of the contract, there cannot be compromises to the stream of what we are seeing. So if we are looking at the way forward, sometimes we need to, after dealing with the contract, the benefits, the economic benefits, we should look at accountability. And that can come if we have both civil society and other parties involved in the monitoring of these contracts. That will help. But if we do it in our side, just like we've gone to the high court, when we rule and they go out, what happens to them? U.S. was able to sanction or punish someone for some of the misconduct. But when the companies get back to China, it becomes difficult. That is why we think, to some extent, that government of China probably have supported some of these corporations to be able to do what they, is, they are doing currently. Why? Because if it doesn't go well, there should be mechanism to sanction them back home. But if you don't do that, it becomes problematic. So my, my, in short, I'm saying that if your government and our government are not going to take that step, let us for, uh, negotiate, not force them. Negotiate to have civil society and other bodies being part of the process to be able to bring that accountability to bear. That's an excellent comment. And, and Jing Ying and I have actually talked about this and one of the things she has done, and I'm, we're starting to do in our Zimbabwe situation, is China, as a government, signed on to the SDGs in 2015, and they report annually to the UN on how they're progressing on the SDGs. When you read the Chinese ambassador to the UN's report on how their green, what they call a green, a green initiative as part of their Belt and Road Initiative, how they're going to make sustainable this whole economic system we've just been talking about, you read those words, you're going, it sounds wonderful. They're doing everything right. They're protecting the environment. They're protecting rights. They're protecting climate. They're doing all this. But when you take that document at the UN, which is made for UN consumption, and take it down to the granular level in Guinea or Zimbabwe or Kenya or someplace else, 
it falls apart. And you get the Chinese embassy saying, civil society, stop criticizing us because we're just helping your country uh, evolve and become better economically. So it's just a, how about in the middle section? We've got time, but I'll come back over. How about, yes, ma'am, right here in the second row, I guess you're in, yes. Hi, my name is Megan Price. This is actually perhaps a bit of a novice question, so I really uh, appreciate your humoring me a bit. Uh, and it actually relates a bit to, to, to Jonathan, I believe's question about accountability on the back end. What, is, what are some of the corporational governance structures? In the US, for example, we have shareholder uh, commissions and there's a legal responsibility to shareholders and you've seen that been able to activate shareholder activism to hold companies like, uh, like Shell accountable. Are there anything analogous with Chinese corporations where they might be uh, accountable to individual citizens who are shareholders? We, yeah, we don't have such a uh, shareholder advocacy um, practice uh, in within China, but there are uh, some new uh, uh, initiative we can consider to use. Uh, first, like the ESG uh, uh, information disclosure uh, requirement. Uh, and both uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange uh, has. Uh, uh, have announced uh, uh, some requirement, uh, stronger requirement uh, require uh, those public treated on those uh, the two uh, markets uh, to uh, disclose um, the ESG information, uh, and uh, Chinese government has also has uh, made a very uh, strong regulation on the uh, environment uh, information disclosure. But all those are uh, just. All those regulations, new initiatives, can only apply to corporation, Chinese corporation, for their operation within China. So that is um, uh, the work um, we, as our organization and uh, clinical project, uh, we are uh, trying to do. Um, uh, Chinese uh, company subsidiaries, they're all over the world. They are not reporting their environment conduct, you know, human rights conduct outside, beyond China's borders. So that is a point we want to make uh, by providing the facts. So we are now doing the one uh, project, uh, just uh, focus, uh, tracing one Chinese corporation and look at its operation in DRC, in Peru, uh, in Serbia, and we connect the evidence to show uh, it's very uh, crucial for shareholder to understand uh, Chinese corporation, the, those public treated corporation, their uh, conduct beyond China's border. So that is an instrument we want to uh, build. Uh, we want to explore that path, uh, uh, use uh, ESG disclosure requirement, and that that is uh, what. Um, other like the uh, China has made uh, certain uh, quite a strong pledge on the climate climate change like the no uh, um, f new um, overseas coal burning plants that pledge was made by Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in uh, September last year. Um, um, we are trying to use, it's a pledge, it's like a promise. Um, if you are not uh, accepted by Chinese uh, laws and regulation, uh, it's just a pretty uh, word. And uh, we want to make um, that pledge uh, actions. Uh, so um, after this, uh, this forum, I'm going to Guinea and Chinese mining corporation are building six small scale Co burning plants in that country, and we will um, stop those uh, that trend. Uh, small scale um, um, company corporate uh, um, um, made uh, power generator just for the uh, that mining company itself. Uh, we want to uh, stop that um, um, the six uh, co burning plants. Uh, in, in Guinea, so we want to use that pledge and apply to um, the the country which receive a lot of the Chinese investment. Yeah, I, I, my experience in Zimbabwe is January this year. I mentioned earlier the civil society groups, 26 of them in Zimbabwe, put out a manifesto listing all the things that the Chinese companies were doing wrong, backed by the Chinese government. And the Chinese ambassador came out and said. This is the Chinese ambassador to the country, so this is a diplomat 
appointed by the Chinese government to be their ambassador in Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe. And he said, in so many words, if the local laws or the country's laws don't protect their citizens, that's not our problem. If the laws don't prevent the harms that the citizens are seeing for climate change, for environmental harm, for labor harm, for human rights problems, and the local laws don't do that, then we don't have to step outside of the contract we have and do anything about it. And that's an arrogant position. That's one of the things we're trying to talk about with the environmental group in Zimbabwe is how do we counter that kind of language? And that's where the war of words between the U.S. ambassador and the Chinese ambassador in Zimbabwe now stands as of about two weeks ago. Any other questions here in the middle? Yes, sir. How about you right here? Sure, thank you. Hi, I'm Pella. I'm 19 years old, uh, which is maybe the youngest in this room, and some of you might think maybe a young and um, not so expertise mind shouldn't speak about these issues. Um, but I'm from the movement World Youth for Climate Justice, which is actually started in um, Vanuatu in the Pacific. Um, and from the story of Ms. Barca, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, but um, it's very important that especially these people um, talk about these issues. Um, and from the examples that Mr. Dehain and Ms. And Ms. Xi Jinping um, shared, we see that court cases or treaties or, con or conventions can be really important uh, for you all lawyers um, to make a case against companies to hold people accountable. Um, we are currently campaigning to get an advisory opinion um, by the International Court of Justice, the highest court uh, here in The Hague. It's a really pretty building. You should uh, see it if you <laughs> have the time. <laughs> um, and this would mean that they will establish uh, a relationship between human rights and climate change. Currently, there's no such thing worldwide. There are some cases like here in the Netherlands between Shell. Um, but it's important that this happens also worldwide. Um, and this would be the magic one that we, as an organization, would choose to uh, change the world. And I was uh, wondering for the panel, uh, what would it look like if we get such an advisory opinion um, from the International Court of Justice to establish a relationship between uh, climate change and human rights? What could this mean for these, uh, well, for lawyers in this room or for um, all of your work? Well, uh, since you talked about Vanatu, let me ask Betty to talk about the impacts on what... I I mean, at the end of the day, the, the most vulnerable from climate change are those who are affected anywhere in the world by sea level rise, those whose livelihood is affected because in their country uh, the, the climate has changed and so the lands they were farming or pasturing are no longer available because there's no grass or, or uh, feed for the animals. Uh, it could be because uh, the water supply is drying up because it's too warm. And so arid conditions are sitting in where it used to be very wet. So the, the climate change impacts are not just for folks who are living in low-level areas, but obviously they're the ones who are most visibly and quickly affected because when you got to move from your home, then you know your life has changed forever. So. Betty, let me let you talk about this some. Sure. I, again, I could talk about this for a long time, and thank you for the question. I think for me, in the most simplistic way, what this would mean is people are actually listening to us. Ears and ears of Pacific people's advocacy have been falling on deaf ears. This is not a futuristic threat. People in, not just the Pacific, people across the globe, Bangladesh, Mauritius, Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, everybody is feeling impacts of climate change. So for me, this would show that the international community is listening and is willing to take action. So it would mean um, it, it's not falling on deaf ears. So th that would be hopeful for me. But I do know that there are senior people from the UN um, who have served in the UN Council and senior litigators here too who also know uh, the value of it. And I'd be very happy to hear what this would mean um, for them too. Uh. Yeah. Well, I think if you were to take a look at the Royal Dutch Shell opinion, which is now an appeal from the court here in The Hague, and you look at the elements of the decision, in a regular court opinion, you'd say the applicable law to this situation is the law of country A you're in. How does the law apply to the conduct in question? So the Hague court said, under Dutch law, you're in violation of the law by not protecting the citizens of this country. But they went on to then cite the IPCC report, uh, business and human rights, uh, guiding principles on human rights, 
and other UN principles. They also cited to sort of soft law, international law, and all of that is, is a very interesting opinion because it is an opinion you would think they decided here's the outcome we want. How do we justify the outcome? We're going to use every possible line of reasoning we can go down and put them all together in one opinion. It's a fascinating opinion, which is no reason to doubt that why a reason that Shell has appealed it is because they see this as opening Pandora's box for them because if all of this law can come into them, both hard law and soft law, then they have a very difficult time uh, defending this moving forward no matter where they are in the world. And that's one of the reasons why they're concerned about it. And, and that's true for Exxon and Mobil and every other big oil company. And uh, it was mentioned earlier, the EITI, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Under that, uh, there's a set of standards that this organization has put together and then governments come in and say, we want our country to govern how extractive industries occur in our country pursuant to these standards. So you mentioned that Guinea is a member of that, Zimbabwe is not, by example. And so when you're a member of that, you say, okay, here's our laws. The laws are subject to an audit by EITI auditors to see that they're valid laws. They can be validly enforced. There's mechanisms to enforce them. And so if the impacts of mining are environmental, climate change, human rights, labor rights, whatever the issues may be, then there ought to be a right to challenge that in the local court in the, in the country that is a member of the EITI. Uh, what we're finding, at least in my experience, and Jingy, I'd be interested in your experience too, is that no matter the fact that the country said we're going to follow that, it's the practical impact of that when mine company X comes in before a tribunal and they're where they really want to follow the law even though the country said they would. Has that, that been what your experience has been? Using EITI. EITI, yeah. yeah uh, we, uh, I think the EITI is, uh, I consider is more the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, in, uh, initiative. Right. Not only uh, government is playing a role, uh, civil society, uh, community, scholars uh, all contribute to that effort. Um, so I think it's a very uh, great, uh, a initiative we, it could be uh, used for the climate related uh, um, uh, advocacy work I see as uh, uh, NGO and civil society uh, litigate I always want to use it advocacy I think it's also in, uh, very important you're talking about uh, uh, the case uh, uh, climate change uh, is a threat um, to uh, humanity. It's a human rights issue. So we, if we can have such a precedent, that would show um, that we can use uh, the legal instrument under the international environment treaties as well as international human rights treaties. Because I think the international human rights treaty provides um, um, more um, um, Legal avenues uh, for community uh, uh, communities uh, to use. Um, we have a regional, like Africa and Latin America, regional court of human rights. Um, we, that uh, legal avenue we can use. We have a UN uh, uh, mechanism, UN special uh, repertoire, like the UN human rights special um, procedure we can use. So uh, if we can combine these two sets of the uh, legal instruments together, that would be very powerful, and it also can help us shift the narrative. It's not only about the uh, climate, the, uh, the nature, it's our ourself, our rights, yeah. our people's <laughs> rights uh, to, to live our, uh, our livelihood. Um, so we hope, uh, we, we see, uh, the, we expect the good uh, precedent uh, could be made. Thank you for your work. Yes, how about, yes ma'am. Wait, 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 put a, wait, put a microphone, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you for this very interesting uh, panel. Um, I, I think like what, relating to what was said here and what uh, uh, my colleagues heard here, um, one of the challenges is uh, um, the absence of uh, hard law obligations on TNCs. Um, and like we, we, that's what happened like with the Danish, Royal Danish uh, and the international investment arbitration. So um, what do you think about uh, the UN uh, treaty uh, on uh, um, binding instrument for uh, TNCs and how can it help you? It can help you with your litigation and uh, 
um, improving um, the situation of climate change because as we see like the people affected are a, a people who has a kind of uh, a very weak voice and uh, and so on thank you I, I'm relating to the uh, you yeah. I mean, we're not I, sure we understood the question. We're going to give you, I think, what we think is an answer. How about that? No, I'm uh, to the UN working group, the one about yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got it. She was, uh, yeah. Oh, transnational. I, I, I knew that. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew that uh, the, it has been, yeah, for some years. Uh, and the, so yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really specific on, I think, uh, the issue around uh, the. A member um, a state of the UN Human Rights Council's obligation on right. the extraterritorial right. obligations. So right. that is a core issue. Um, right now, we I think, especially for China, it is a core issue um, because Belt Road Initiative, which uh, um, drive uh, many Chinese corporations operating beyond China's borders. Uh, and so we won't talk about the uh, extraterritorial obligation. Tradi traditionally, it's a state, a member state, uh, the government obligation. When we're talking about uh, state-owned enterprise or private enterprise, uh, um, what their obligation could be, especially on the climate change. I think uh, we need to add, uh, add that article to the binding uh, treaty on the multinationals and liability to the uh, environment and the climate. If you read the Secretary General's report on the SDG status that he just issued a couple weeks ago, he makes it very clear that it's not just each national government doing their own job, it's all the countries have to cooperate together if we're gonna achieve the goal. And I think he repeats that over and over again, and I think that's apparent from the SDGs. I mean, the SDGs were adopted by all the member nations of the unanimously by every member of the nation of the United States or in the UN in 2015. But the reports that come back are country by country on how you're progressing on meeting the SDGs in your country. There's very little reporting about what's being done across a globe in terms of, other than sort of, you know, if you're gonna reduce pollution or uh, protect water rights or whatever it may be in the SDGs, there's very little, at least in my opinion, very little being done to aggregate all of that information into one bigger report because the member states saying, okay, yes, we as member states agree, we will follow these in our own country. Um, and so the, as most things in the UN is if the UN adopts a resolution, then the country said, the country that's voted for it will say, I'll do this in my country. You need to have these international you know, human rights issues uh, transnational, all of those things are all part of the process, and I think the SDGs kind of, it gets all jumbled up, and if I do this, it takes away from that, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it's taking so long to get done. Any other, yes, ma'am, back in, or, or, you're wearing orange, I can't quite tell the color from here. Is it orange? Very Dutch. Very Dutch, yeah, <laughs> yes, okay. I'm not actually from the Netherlands, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, uh, you know, peace, love, and justice. So I'm <laughs> trying to tap into that. Um, so um, Anastasia from International Partnership for Human Rights. I'll have two questions for both. Um, maybe I should stand up um, for each uh, panelist. So for Ms. Xingjing, um, I actually wanted to hear more about this. Um, I feel like there is a bit of an omission of Central Asian countries, although they are a big part of Belt and Road Initiative. So I feel there there has been a lot of discussion also what you were talking about in about Latin America or Africa. So if you could uh, expand a bit more and elaborate why Central Asian countries have been admitted and we don't hear more about this huge infrastructure uh, projects there done by Chinese government, Chinese corporations. Um, so I'd like to hear more about that. And to Ms. Bacha, I wanted to hear about this um, uh, UN uh, Human Rights Committee decision on um, a man from Kiribati against New Zealand, yeah, so there was this climate refugee um, title that he sought, and if you could, exp I know he lost the case, <laughs> but if you could tell more like about the possibility to use that case in, in you know, future litigations and what kind of doors does it open? Thank so you. So 
before y'all answer, uh, we've got Josh, we've got five minutes left, is that right? Yes. Sir. So if y'all could answer quickly, and then we can do some wrap-up commentary, please. Okay, I could very quickly answer that. Um, firstly, the Pacific people at least have very strong feelings about the term climate refugee um, and the, the way that that is being acknowledged in the international arena. We, um, and so I think that needs a lot more thought um, process going into it. However, that l decision by the UN Council was a landmark decision and has been welcomed and will be interpreted. So it, I mean, it is only a few years old. And while that man, you know, Ioane uh, did lose the case, I think it has been welcomed by countries in the region. Um, and it is a welcome move and we, we look forward to other countries actually implementing um, implementing and em embodying that decision holistically, not tangentially. So I think there is much to be seen and it is assuring actually. So let's see, there is hope. Talking about uh, Central Asia you know, or landlocked countries and they are mineral rich countries and uh, they are uh, China's, they call the Belt Road uh, partner country. They, or joined uh, China's Better Road Initiative because they need uh, investment uh, for their building the infrastructure and China can pro provide such capital. Um, and of course, I, I, I knew the negative impact of, uh, mentioned all the environment issue, human rights issue, uh, bribery, corruption issue. Um, the same uh, issue can be found in Central Asia. But Central Asia is extremely difficult uh, region to work on because uh, the, the regime and the uh, lack of the, um, the transparency and uh, no um, very few active uh, civil society organizations uh, which I can collaborate with. So all these difficulties make me, um, um, yeah, I haven't been there, I tried to go there, uh, I haven't reached there yet. Uh, um, but uh, certainly, I think a similar issue can be found along China's uh, over the 100, more than 120 Belt Road uh, partner countries. Um, the similar issue. So the, I think the, it's China's responsibility uh, to put the stronger regulation on those uh, uh, Chinese cooperation, Chinese uh, project. It's also those countries receive um, Chinese investment those country governments uh, and those uh, civil society organizations, their, um, their responsibility and to stand up, to voice a different uh, the voice. Like the Ghan, uh, our Ghan, Ghani uh, friend said, uh, civil society should be on, yeah, in the negotiation. Uh, that is ideal picture, but most time, uh, all those negotiation are, uh, um, yeah, not in the public domain. So we need uh, action. We need to raise bars from both sides, from China and from those countries received uh, Chinese um, investment. Uh, we need a strong uh, action from both sides. Thanks. A um, few closing comments. I'm, we could go on for hours here, I know that, but we can't uh, in our time frame. One of the things we wanted to do with this is to introduce you to the topics uh, get you to think about it. Again, if you haven't seen the QR code of the website, go there and read all the material that's there, which is, eliminates this issue. It's a, we're at the top of the pyramid. It just goes out and out and out. So take a look at all of that. If you're from an organization that wants to partner with the or associate with the ABA in terms of our climate or environmental justice work, come up to me and let me know afterwards. We'll see how we can begin to collaborate with you moving forward. In terms of one particular collaborator, Namati, is having a program this afternoon at 2.30. Access to justice, land, and environmental advocates need to protect us all from climate change, four components of the solution. So I promised the people from Namati that I would advertise their program for this afternoon at 2.30. I plan to be there to listen to that. We had a Zoom call with them to sort of figure out how we collaborate with each other. So we want to partner with them moving forward. Again, I want to thank you all for being here today. Let's please give a round of applause to our <laughs> panel. Please.